Good morning. Open your Bibles to um, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 as we continue to march through Scripture. This is Peter talking to the church, and the church is under suffering, and they're getting ready to go through more suffering. And as the church suffers, a lot of times it is our tendency to either want to fight back or hunker down. Kind of like, you know, steel ourselves against the blows that are coming or to lash out in anger because it's easy to lash out when people are coming after you. Whenever you come at me, I want to fight you back or else I just want to run away. To sit in a, in a position of victory, knowing that the battle is won, is a very hard thing to do and it takes Christian character. So the suffering church is a church that's supposed to be victorious. We don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. Because Jesus died on the cross and rose again, we know that we have the victory. So we have to claim the victory. He calls us in um, chapter 2, he says that we are his chosen people, that we're a royal priesthood, that we're a holy nation, and that we're God's precious possession. As he calls us that, there's a reason why. And it says that we are to show the goodness of God to others and to bring people from darkness to light. So the reason why we are his precious possession is for a purpose. And the purpose is that people would see the light in, inside of us. And I've known people in my life before where I wondered if they were Christians or not. And as hard times started to fall down on them, and terrible things started to happen to them, I saw Christ come to the top. Because the things in our life that can get burned up, shaken, moved around, do get burned up, shaken, and moved around. And what shows is your character. And God is about our character. So as, as the church goes through suffering, Jesus needs to come to the top. So um, he talked in um, last chapter, chapter 2, about respecting all authority. And um, that was respecting the king and all the, all the king's um, appointees, the governors that he um, appointed. And that's not a very popular subject. And so the question would be, why? And the question of why is so that we're not encumbered by fighting with the powers that be. The next thing he talked about was accepting the authority of your employer. Why? So that we're unencumbered from sharing the gospel. These things are all about the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 27, it's a really important corollary passage. It says, even though I am f a free man... With no master, I become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. So Paul says, I'm a free man. I don't have a master. He says, but I become a slave to all men so I can win some to Christ. He says, when I was with the, the Jews, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. Now, why is he living like that? Why is he living under the law when he doesn't have to? I can tell you a practical example. I've been to India about three times. I don't break out the barbecue and put a bunch of burgers on the grill and say, come on, let's have an outreach to the, to the people of India. Why? Because the cow is sacred over there. Can you imagine? I wouldn't. So I... I live under their rules so I don't offend them so I can tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't make me fake. It means I can take my liberties and put them to the side so I can reach people. And that's what Paul's saying. It says, I'm with the, when I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore, ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. So he's saying when he's with the lawless, the people who are under the law, he doesn't live under the law. He says, but I still obey the law of Christ. doesn't mean it's a free-for-all. You know, you don't go out and start beating people up when, when you're with people that beat people up so you can witness to them. It's not like, it's not like a, a do whatever you want to, just be whoever you're around. It means put apart the things that are optional so you can be optimally witnessing to people. When I am with those who are weak, 
I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share it with his blessings. So he's willing to put aside all of his freedoms, all of his liberties, so he can better reach people. And then I can't read this passage without reading the next part, which is more my speed, more my flavor. It says, do you real not realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win the prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with a purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So what he's saying is, this thing is a competition. Not amongst each other, but against yourself. Who can you reach for the Lord? And what lengths will you go to do it? Are you willing to become a slave to all men so that you can win them to Christ? So that's what Christian liberty and Christian freedom is about. It's not about performing to a certain level so that we're righteous and God will listen to our prayers and do what we say. God's not a cosmic pop machine to put, keep putting in your quarters. I went to church. I gave some money. I sat through that boring sermon. <laughs> I did this. I did that. So God give me my beautiful life. That's not how Christianity works. We do what we're supposed to do because we love the Lord, because we want to become stronger in the Lord so we can witness to other people. We want to practice our Christianity in such a way that it attracts people to Christianity, putting aside our own freedoms so they don't get in the way of somebody else coming to the Lord. So these things we do so that they're not a hindrance to the gospel. And then he gives an example in the last part of chapter 2 about Christ, how that he humbly came from heaven to earth and didn't hold on to his rights as God. I mean, he was still all God, but he put it aside so he could reach people. He put aside his rights so he could reach people. So this Christian liberty is, is for a cause. It's for the cause of edification, like building up other people. And it's for the cause of... Um, telling other people about Christ, reconciliation. So that's chapter 2. As we head into chapter 3, it says, likewise. So in the same kind of attitude and manner, it says, in the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news, their godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him her master. You are the daughter's you are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands will do. And then it says, likewise, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be, the, be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of the new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. So I think that speaks for itself. Let's just move on. Some people think that's a controversial passage. I will note that there's six verses for the women and one for the men. Why do you think that is? I think it speaks for itself. Because men can only remember one thing at a time. <laughs> or, if, or if you went down to the pound to get a dog, there'd be a lot of instructions for you, right? But none for the dog. Um. <laughs> so I'll let that sink in. No, this shouldn't be controversial because it says likewise before the men and likewise before the women. There is an order to things, and God has put an order on things. There's authorities and there's structures. And it talks about there's not, 
When you have an authority structure, it doesn't mean one person is more valuable than another person. It doesn't mean one person is better than another person. When I was in the military, I listened to whoever was above me in rank. Not because they were smarter, because things just work easier that way. Um, it works easier when there's an order to things. So you don't, the men aren't superior and women are inferior. In no way is that possible. It says the women are the weaker vessel. And um, I was trying to think of an analogy. And Oh, by the way, my wife is the cello player. <laughs> that, that's my girl. Whenever she plays well, I go, that's my wife. And when she plays bad, I'm like, ah. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I punched my nephew in the shoulder and said, that's my wife up there. Um, no, um, so I don't even know where I'm at anymore. <laughs> I think I buried myself a hole. But <laughs> the analogy of the weaker. Now, if you're looking at musical instruments, there's a thing in violins called a Stradivarius. And that thing is light. I mean, it's the lightest violin you can get, and it's the best sound you can get because it's a fine instrument. It might be weaker, but that doesn't mean it's less because when you're a kid and you learn the violin, they give you a violin-shaped object. <laughs> and you can basically pound in nails <laughs> in the wall with it because it's heavy duty. And they give that strong one to the kids because if you've ever been to a concert, you see kids dropping their instruments all the time. You drop a Stradivarius, that's a couple hundred thousand dollars down the tubes in repairs because the things are worth millions. So just because something's finer and not as strong doesn't mean that it is in any way not equal just because it's more fragile. I mean, I have a lot of um, tools, and I think that my hammer is probably the strongest, but it's not the brightest tool in the, in the shed, you know. But it does what it does, and it does it well. Um, the reason that we have six verses for the women is, is very simple. There, there's a lot of things here. I, w I want you to notice something. When it talks about you submitting to the authority of the government, let's say you don't. I had a guy argue with me this week. and he was, It was on Wednesday night. We had a good discussion, and I said, I'm not going to argue with you. Argue with um, 1 Peter chapter 2. You know, um, it says to do it, not me. You know, so if you want to fight the man, if you want to fight the government, I'll just ask you, how does that work out? Who wins in that battle? Let's say you want to fight your employer. How does that work out for you? Let's say as a woman you want to be unsubmissive to your husband. How does that work out? Let's say as a husband you want to be a thug to your wife, not deal with her in respect. Uh, how does that work out for you? So these instructions, this isn't like a section for the wives so that I could as a husband crack my wife over the head with this. This is for her to be able to get along with me for her life to be simpler so she can spread the gospel better, so she, she's not encumbered by this friction that is fighting between a man and a wife. I think it's funny that it talks about the suffering church, and then it gives us thing <laughs> in marriage. It's like, okay, let's talk about this kind of suffering. You know, because <laughs> cause in marriage, it can be really rough. Marriages can be some of the worst. It can be some of the best things, but it can be some of the worst things. And as a married person, you, you know that. Because if your marriage isn't right, nothing's right. It's like a joint out of place. You just can't, uh, you know. So that's why the Bible devotes time to it. It says to um, accept the authority of your husbands, and it says, if they're not saved, do this so that you can win them without words. That the way that you live would be a gospel track. The way that you live, that your Christianity is a benefit to your marriage. Not that you're, you know, pounding him over the head with the Bible every chance you get or slipping a track into his peanut butter and jelly sandwich or <laughs> whatever happens to be the case. You know, you're not being obnoxious with your faith. You're being the kind of person that you're, it's attractive. Um, the other thing it says is that it's about trusting God, not about trusting that man of yours. Abraham called I mean, Sarah called Abraham Lord, and so I insist that Angie call me Lord. <laughs> Lord Richard. Um, has a ring to it, doesn't it? <laughs> no, we were, we were joking on the way here. It's like, 
Lord, wake up. <laughs> Lord, delusional. Lord, it's never going to happen. <laughs> That's not the kind of relationship we have. She doesn't walk around calling me Lord. The, the kind of relationship we have is where she trusts, not me, she trusts God in me. That if I'm out of line, God will do the correcting. God will do that. But if she decides one day, you know, theoretically she's never done this, but if she decides that I'm out of line and she wants to correct me, how do you think that goes? If she's out of line and I want to correct her, how do you think that goes? I don't trust her. I trust God in her. I would encourage anybody who's looking at marriage or potential mates, you better find somebody who is totally dependent on God. That's the prerequisite for a mate. Find somebody who can't live without a relationship with God. That way, if they're treating you poorly, you can just go, I'll turn you over to the Lord. Because I can't, I can't make people act like they're supposed to. I got four kids that have shown me that. <laughs> I can't make them behave. I can show them. I can talk to them. But I can't make them do anything. If you invest in, in your relationships and grounding people, tethering people to a relationship with God, that's the only way to quote-unquote control them because they're going to act godly because they have a relationship with God, not because you made them. If you get to the point where you try to manipulate people and make people do what you want to do and conform them into the image of what you want, I don't want to be in that relationship, do you? So this idea of calling Abraham Lord was her going, all right, because Abraham did a lot of silly things. He says uh, stupid things, sinful things. They walked into a new territory. His wife's beautiful. He says, hey, why don't we tell everybody that you're my sister? That way they won't kill me. Now, you'll get put in a harem. I don't know what will happen to you, but I won't be dead. He did that twice. So he was not always um, about looking after his wife. But she trusted God saying, I'll trust God. I'll trust the Lord that he's put this guy in place and even if he makes bozo moves, I'll come out all right. And she did. And we could do the same thing whether it be the government. We go, hey, <laughs> I can't change the world by complaining. I'm going to be a submissive, um, go-along person. But I want to I wanna, I wanna nuance that a little bit. Because each one of us are individuals. And God's called each one of us to do something different. Every choice we make, it opens the doors to some people and closes the doors to others. So if I wear a Trump hat, some people are going to be like, don't talk to me about anything. But other people are going to be like, hey, what's up with that? And you'll be able to have conversations with people that you weren't able to have before. There are people in this church that have conversations and have rapport with people I'll never be able to reach. And there's people that I have rapport with that you'll never be able to reach. Each one of us are called to be individuals and do what God's asked us to do individually. So I, I think I wasn't clear because I got some feedback last week, and good feedback. I like it when people talk to me They're like, well, how's that work? How's this work? How's the other one thing work? Are we supposed to be doormats? Are we supposed to be, you know, are we supposed to be milk toast? The last thing a Christian is supposed to be is milk toast. Salt, light, and the city on a hill looks nothing like milk toast. It looks nothing like no character. But what I'm saying is it takes no character to stand up and fight. It takes character to keep your powder dry and take your shots the way that you're supposed to. So I, I hope that clears it up, and if there's any more if you have any other input, bring it on. Because I, I love to refine the message so that people can understand it. I don't want anyone walking around thinking, ah, he wants us to be mamby-pamby, milk-toast Christians. Last thing in the world that I want. Because you are distinct when you're distinctly what God made you. And when you fight from victory and not for victory, you're like, we already won. So I can be who God asked me to be. As a wife, you can be, I can be submissive to my husband. Why? Because I don't have to worry about him. When it comes to husbands, it says, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. 
Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but you're, you, she is your equal partner in God's gift to a new life. Treat her as you should, and your prayers will not be hindered. Again, why would a husband do this? Because it is absolutely in his best interest to. It is absolutely in the best interest of God's kingdom to honor your wife, to know your wife, and count your wife as a fellow heir with you. If you treat her any other way than that, it's going to be nothing but friction, and I guarantee you your witness and your testimony will not be what it's supposed to be in the world. And there's three things there. And I, I know that, that God inspired this because I can only ever remember three things at a time. The thing that I'm doing, the thing that I'm going to do next, and the thing I'm going to do after that. If it gets beyond three things, I have to write a list. So, it says, finally, in verse 8, all of you Christians should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. So as Christians, we're to be of one mind, unified with each other, not repaying evil for evil. Instead, pay people back with a blessing. Um, my dad taught me from a very young age, how do you get rid of your enemies? Make them your friend. Make them your friend. Find out about people. Find out where they're coming from. Make them your friend and you won't have enemies. So it says, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. And again, this takes godly character. It takes no character whatsoever to go evil for evil, insult for insult, hard feelings for hard feelings. That's as easy as falling down. Every kid in the nursery knows how to do this. You grab my toy, I grab your toy. You go, mm, I go, mm. you know, just action, reaction takes Christian character to go, hold on a second, <laughs> breathe. What's the best thing for the kingdom of God right now? Not what's fair, what did they do to me? You don't know what they did to me. You don't know how uh, injustice was. You don't know. It's like, it doesn't matter. What's best for the kingdom of God? Because if you just went by justice, we'd all be in hell, right? If by justice, Jesus wouldn't have come down and gave his life for us. He says, that is why, that is what God has called you to do, and he will bless you for it. So why do we do that? Because God will bless us for it. If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace. Work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Each one of these things that he just said takes effort. Keep your tongue. Turn away. Do good. Search for peace. Work to maintain. Salvation is all God's. He does all the saving and he does all the forgiving. But if you want your Christianity to work, if you want it to be right, then do what God has given you the ability to do, which is keep your tongue. Turn away. Do. Search. Work to maintain it. These are things that you can do, because sometimes people ask, well, what's my part if it's all grace? Exercise the character that he's given you. It says, now who will harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Don't worry or be afraid of the world's threats. This is a direct quote in the original text from Isaiah chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, which is one of the coolest passages that we have about, you know, the world comes down on us, and the world has got these plans to destroy Christianity. they got these plans to do bad things to us, and I think if you have the Internet, you know all about those plans, right? Those secret plans, not-so-secret plans. The Assyrians are coming down to destroy Israel. And the prophet Isaiah is given this message from God. And it's Isaiah 8, chapter 11, or Isaiah 8, verse 11. It says, The Lord has given me a strong warning 
not to think like everyone else does. He said, don't call everything a conspiracy like they do. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He's the one you should fear. He's the one that should make you tremble. Don't call everything a conspiracy like they do. Who's they? The world. The world's walking around in fear of what the plans that are coming for us. So don't walk around, call everything a conspiracy like they do, and don't live in dread of what frightens them. Should Christians be fearful? No. It says, make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He's the one who you should fear. He's the one who should make you tremble. So, we just need to make sure we're doing what God tells us to do. He has a great plan for us. He's empowered us to do it. He's given us the stage to do it in. In this dark world around you, the idea of confidence and victory, wow, what a beacon in the night. What a city on a hill. What a light stream that is. What a little bit of salt in this world. So don't live in fear like the rest of the world does. It, it, it's funny if you say, I believe in a God that's all-powerful and all-knowing. He's got everything under control. I trust him with my eternity, and then walk around afraid. Or some of us aren't sophisticated enough to feel fear. I'm not a very fearful person. I'm an angry person. I skip the fear and go right to anger. I remember we used to fish not far from here, down on the river, and um, called it Norm Norm Parent's place, I think it was, or oh no, Bert's. We used to first fish down on Bert's for walleyes, and um, coming out of that place at night was spooky, man. It was like just pitch dark, and there's big old bullfrogs jumping around, and lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, you know. God forbid you jump a deer and it starts blowing at you or whatever. But you're like, so instead of being afraid. I would flip it over to anger, like mm, something comes out of me, I'm going to attack. So I think at a, at a very young age, I, s I started flipping all my fear to anger. So now I don't have the sophistication to feel fear. I just go straight to anger. So I'm not a fearful Christian. I'm an angry Christian. <laughs> Much better, right? <laughs> Either one, the world looks at, whether you're fearful or whether you're angry, what does the world say? What do they think when they see that? Hmm, not real. No underlying power. What should we be as Christians? Confident, bold, under control, and humble. So that when the world's falling apart, we have a confidence to us and a, and a this thing of, hey, this isn't all there is. There's a hereafter. It's not about the here and now. It's about the hereafter. That's the strength of our message. So, we're supposed to respect authority. We're supposed to um, be under control. It says, don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about the Christian hope in verse 15, always be ready to explain it. So always be ready to explain this Christianity that's percolating inside of you. Think of ways and strategies that you're going to talk to people when they talk to you about why you're different. Because so, sometimes people say, why are you so happy? Why are you different? And it's really easy to go, just having a good day. You could think of strategies and say something like, well, I know how the story ends. Like, huh, what's, well, yada, 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 I die and go to heaven. I'm a, I'm a believer, so this is all temporary for me. Do you have a relationship with Christ? Where do you go when things get tough? You know, there's a lot of thought-provoking questions that aren't offensive that you can think of when someone asks you for the joy and the hope that lies within you. Um, so it says, always be ready to um, explain it. And it says, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. <laughs> that isn't always the case of Christian apologetics, is it? A lot of Christian apologists are just rude, just haughty, just egotistical. My advice is don't listen to those people. Don't 
don't listen to it and say, I'll just pick out the facts and use those. Because you know what will happen? The attitude will rub off on you. The attitude of a Christian apologist will be like, you morons. I discovered Jesus. Why don't you? Can't you figure out if somebody made this room, somebody made the world? What are you, stupid? There's a world maker. Can you imagine trying to win someone that way? To the, you know, for the Lord? That's, they're going to be like, you're rude. Get away from me. Approach people where they are with gentleness and respect, knowing that they're made in the image of God and they deserve the respect that all human beings deserve. It says, keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if it is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once and for all. He never sinned. But he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So what it's saying is, Jesus Christ rose from the grave. That is our victory. He defeated death. It says, he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Now this is interesting. It's a very interesting passage. A lot of people interpret it a lot of different ways. And all I can tell you for sure is that when Jesus died, he didn't just have a little um, brief episode with death. He died completely, was buried completely, went to the spirit world for three days, and completely conquered death utterly from the very top to the very bottom. That's what I can tell you. We have nothing to fear in the spirit realm. Death has nothing for us. The spirit realm has nothing for us. We don't have to be afraid of the unseen world. Jesus nailed it. Jesus got it. Now, like I said, there's a lot of interpretations about this particular verse. Don't have any time for it right now, and I'm not sure I even know which one to believe. So you can research that on your own. It says, um, only eight people are saved from drowning in the terrible flood. And, and that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience is affected because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, baptism does not regenerate anybody. I don't believe in baptismal regeneration. In other words, you can get baptized a dozen different ways. It doesn't make you saved. There's only one thing that makes you saved. Trusting Christ as your Savior. Now, if you trust Christ as your Savior, I do believe that once you've trusted Christ as your Savior, there's a believer's baptism that you are then dead, buried, rose again. And all that is is a symbol. It's a symbol like communion is a symbol. It's a symbol like the marriage ceremony is a, is a symbol. Because being baptized doesn't make you saved. It is proclaiming to the world, this is what's happening to me. You're identifying yourself with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I'll give you a, an example of this which might clarify it. When I've been to India... And we preach the gospel message. You can preach the gospel message all you want. There's one thing you better not do over there. Baptize people. Because what you're doing is you're taking them from their way of belief. You're identifying them now with Christianity in a symbolic way and going, Christian. And that's converting people. So does the baptism convert them? No. The baptism shows that they've been converted and they're making a public proclamation. I'm one of those people. I'm a Jesus person. I'm a death, burial, resurrection person. So that symbol is a strong symbol, but it's only a symbol. When it talks about baptism here, it's talking about being baptized into the body of Christ through the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, you are baptized supernaturally. You're changed, DNA, changed into a new creature, and you're put into the body of Christ universal body now you are part of that body so you're baptized into the body of christ supernaturally it's not an intellectual ascent 
it is a supernatural act of God regenerating your soul and making you born again. New creature. Now, how does a new creature figure out what to do? Put them in the context of the body. Do what God's called you to do. It's like, well, I don't know where I fit in the body. I don't know what I should do. What do you want to do? What do you feel like doing? Where do you see the need? Like I've told you all before, like you walk in here and go, you know what this place needs? Come up and tell me what it is. Because when you tell me, I'm going to go, guess what you're probably called to? <laughs> Whatever you think, when you walked into this place, you know what this place needs? That's the Lord calling you into ministry. When I, when I hear guys teach that don't teach well, I'm like, get out of the way. I want that. I want to do that. I mean, my brother, when he hear, hears people sing that can't sing, like me, he goes, here, get out of the way. I'll sing. <laughs> that He just shook his head because he doesn't feel that way. But what I'm saying is when you walk in and see a deficiency, God's calling you to fill that deficiency. He's putting that quickening in your heart to move forward and do that thing because that's who you are. So it says baptism and it says it's a response to God from a clear conscience. It's effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God. And all the angels and authorities and, uh, and powers accept his authority. That's who we serve. Christ in heaven, sitting on the right hand of God, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. He ain't sweating it. He's not pacing back and forth. Going, oh, I hope they win. Oh, boy, I hope Rich pulls through this week. Oh, you know, hope Angie hits those notes on the cello. Oh, God's not sweating it. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. So that totally frees me up to act the way I was supposed to, knowing that I'm fighting from victory, not for victory knowing that it's a foregone conclusion in his mind, it needs to be a foregone conclusion in my mind. That's the way we face hard times. That's the way we face suffering. And that's the kind of testimony that screams to the world that Christianity is real. The idea of being angry or fearful or fighting all the time with p the authorities around you means you really don't think God's in control, that you've got to pull the strings. You've got to make things happen. That's not trusting in God. So let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word, and thanks for making it plain and clear. As we go through passages like this, I pray that you would um, cut through the clutter sometimes that is my speech or our preconceived ideas and impress your words, your word, into our hearts, that we can truly trust you because you are victorious and you are sitting on your throne, and we're just playing this thing out. So I pray that we would trust you, knowing that we can um, count on you doing what you said, that we can count on the victory that you've won. So thanks again. Help us to be witnesses in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord, sometimes we get so overwhelmed with our struggles and we're, we find ourselves fighting for victory over that. And all too times we lose sight of the fact that as your children, Lord, you've already won the war. And we have a pla platform of victory, Lord, to step forward, to be bold, not, not in our abilities, Lord, but in your faithfulness and your love and your grace that you would like us to share with the world, Lord, that you allow us to share. Lord, I pray that you just shine in us and through us. The world's a dark place right now. A lot of stuff going on. Help us to, to find shelter in you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>